Welcome back. Um, been a while since I saw most of you in uh, fundamentals. Um, there was a question here from the front. So, Jaap, Jose, and Bas are working on grading the assignments and the exam for ASA. And uh, from what I understand, they're nearly done. But of course, they can't put the grades on them until they're completely done. So, it's, I, I, I'm not going to promise you anything, but I know that it's going to be soon. They're working. Okay. Um, so, Yesterday, Sona started uh, this course with you, Stuff of Mathematics. Um, just to refresh your mind, it's not about my mind, but because I know uh, what, what do you remember of Sona's lecture of yesterday? Angles. Angles, right. Angles. Primary, secondary. Quaternary. Quaternary. And what's in between? Tertiary. Yeah, okay. Anything else? Factors. Factors? Ah, oh, yeah. Vectors, angles, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, experimental methods for structure determination. There will actually be a lecture on it I, I, somewhere well, later in the course. Next week? Week after? Yeah. Um, Anything else? Yeah, we sh we sh we shuffled the um, the lectures quite extensively compared to last year, so mm -hmm. no idea where they ended up. At least not from the top of my head. Anything else? Floating data bank. Floating data bank. Yeah. So yeah, that's where we as mathematicians find the structures. They don't magically appear there, but that's where we get them. Yeah. Anything else? My is of properties, right? Um, what <coughs> did she discuss some particular properties of the minor assets? Very short, you mean, probably. Oh, probably 16. But there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, like one, there's one property that we always, almost always mention when we're talking about minor assets. That are actually, no, that's when you have, switch ions, that's when you have the separate, like this one single minor asset as a molecule. Um, no, when they're in the protein. What's important? Because today we're going to talk about floating forward. So if you talk about amino acid properties, what, are, what is the important property of that amino acid has that makes proteins fall? Well, I want to hear it from somewhere else. Hmm? They're hydrophobic. They're all hydrophobic. Some of them are, right? Yeah. So we'll get into that a little bit. Okay, before we go further into the topic, uh, please don't please don't knock the phone because it's just going out. Then I don't know it will be recording something else <laughs> um, or nothing. Um, yeah, before we go into oh yes, uh, so it's a, today's going to be about uh, closing folding. It's about uh, a little bit about the, how how proteins are flexible, but it's a, about Hey, doesn't work. Ah, now it works. Um, about how proteins fall and unfold. Yeah. Right. Now it works. Okay, uh, but before we go into the topic, uh, a few announcements. The first announcement is about announcements. Uh, because we put them on canvas, uh, and usually we put them on canvas because they are vital information. But we've noticed a pattern in the questions that we get that suggests that not everybody of you, and I'm not pointing specific fingers because I don't know, but not, not everybody actually gets, gets or reads these uh, announcements. Right? So this is just to, to inform you that if you don't uh, read the announcements that we put on Canvas. You can have them forwarded to your email. You can read them yourself by clicking on the course and reading the announcements. Um, then it's up to you, right? Yeah, we put them there because it's important. If you miss that, 
that's um, it's more or less your problem. Uh, it's actually not more. It's just your problem. Yeah. Okay. Of course, you can always ask if things are not clear or you think you've missed something. Um, but please don't. And we will try on our sides. We'll try to minimize the traffic on this channel, right? Because we also know that if you get like five or ten announcements each day on a particular course, then of course the important stuff gets drowned out by all, by, by all the other stuff. Yeah, so we'll try to avoid that. Okay. Um, a related thing is the reading material. So who's read chapter who read chapter one before yesterday? I know somebody did. Oh, really? Wow. Because I only, I wanted to put the announcement out earlier, but I only got to it on, on Sunday. Who read chapter twelve before today? Who looked at chapter twelve before today? Uh, okay, so reading and looking at is the same for you guys. I'm not sure if I, all, I always agree. Okay, so you, most of the reading material is actually in the book. So, uh, so the PDF is on Canvas, and if you print it all out, it looks like this. This is actually, uh, this is December 3rd version, and this one still, still has lots of, uh, uh, not in this chapter, lots of notes in it, somewhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like these things. Yeah. Um, we took them out for the PDF version for you guys. Um, so, um, Sandra didn't really mention a lot about the book yesterday, I think. That's what she said to me, right? So, we've been, uh, Sandra and me have been writing this book for about four years, uh, together with, uh, with people in our group, also together with some students. Um, and, and, and also based on the input that we get from the students. So that's also why this time, because we're, we feel that we're nearly finished, and we also know that there's some bigger and uh, lots of small errors still in there. Um, I has been very active on the discussion forum uh, yesterday, uh, up to the point that she asked me, wouldn't you rather just have a summary of me, of, of all the things that I noticed? And I said, well, I'll just put it on the forum, because that way, uh, other people don't have to uh, um, update the, the same error, right? Avoid those. And, and that's one side. The other side is I don't have to collect duplicate uh, sets of uh, corrections and deduplicate that. Okay. So the idea is that you read this stuff before the lecture. Yeah. I, I'm just just realizing this. Would it be fair actually to restrict this rule of five? Uh, comments or corrections or whatever to only the five that you put in before the lecture that the reading material was for as an incentive to actually prepare before I just said, who, who consider if you if you consider this unfair just come see me during coffee break yeah or at the practical okay I think, I'll, I think I'll change the rules to do that. Yeah. Um, there's already an incentive to, to read it early, because otherwise Mariah will, 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 uh, will scoop all the uh, easy errors for you. Right? Yeah. It has to be a unique error. It's only the first one that we force them to get the points. Okay. Um, yes. Oh, yeah. Well, this is how I just cover this. Yeah? Uh, so there's going to be one. And <laughs> 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 Yeah. Are there any questions about this? Oh, morning. It's always wrong. Yeah. It's always wrong. Well, that's good. Um, but this room is better than the other one. Isn't it? I mean, not that it's very good, but the other one. Yeah. So, uh, any questions about this? No. Then we'll go to the topic. So, dynamics and protein folding. And I'll, I'll start doing the first steps into thermodynamics. There will be 
a whole lecture, I was going to say chapter, uh, there's going to be a whole lecture on thermodynamics, in a, well, it's actually also a chapter, in a, uh, uh, later in the, in the, in the course. Uh, so the reading for today was chapter 12, um, and for those of you who, who don't have a, oh, who, who actually, who's, who has a bachelor course on where they use Brandon and Tools? Who's read Brandon and Tools before? Who's had a bachelor course on product construction? That's a small minority. It's, it's don't, don't worry if you haven't, right? We're not assuming that. But if you haven't, then uh, some of the concepts, even though we explain it in the book, they, they might need some more explaining for you, right? So uh, this is a very good uh, book. Uh, it's, it's only like a hundred, 50 or 200 pages or so. It's maybe, maybe it's, it's a fairly compact book, but it, it tells you almost everything you want to know about those instructions. Okay. okay. Um, right. So that's um, yeah. So proteins, and, and Sana hasn't shown you movies yet. Uh, so you might still think of proteins as being sort of oh, I'm not the only one who printed this. Cool. <laughs> um, sorry, just got distracted. Uh, so uh, you might you your image of, of a protein structure, if, if you already have one, might be like uh, more like uh, where is a protein structure on the Like this, right? So you see helices and stuff, and then you look at it and you're like, oh yeah. These two are close together, and you can do all sorts of nice things analyzing that. See where where ligand binds and so on. But in reality, proteins are. That's not what I was hoping for. Let's try that again. Yeah, that's better. Okay, but in reality, proteins are, are much more like this. So uh, of course, this is not a real video. Well, it's a real video. It's not a real recording of a protein molecule. Um, it's it's, a, it's a, um, a video made out of a simulation of protein dynamics. Yeah? Um, but and this is a fatty acid binding protein, and so you see the protein, you see the batter sheets. It's a, it's a, something like a beta barrel, but it's not quite regular. Uh, it has two small helices at the top, and you see a fatty acid here bound to it, as the name of the protein suggests. Um, you also see some other molecules uh, uh, moving around. Uh, those are water molecules, and, and you might might think they're oddly colored, colored because normally water molecules are colored by, uh, normally atoms are colored by their element type, and uh, uh, the, the oxygens are colored red, uh, are they, or blue, or oh, red, you mean. Yes, and the hydrogen is white. Uh, in this case, they, they're colored them differently uh, according to uh, whether they end up in the, uh, the inside of the protein during assimilation. Um, and I'm not good with colors, but one color does end up in, in this. So they, they start somewhere outside and they end up in there. So, um, and there's more water, but it's not shown because otherwise you couldn't see the problem. We'll have a, sim we'll have a, a lecture on simulations later on. I'll, I'll dive more deeply into this. But the, the, the point of this video is to show you, uh, instead of just telling you that proteins are moving. <coughs> but the important thing also to see is that uh, even though everything is moving, it's also stable. Yeah, it just doesn't doesn't just fall apart or, or, or something. These even, of course, it fluctuates, but but the this the beta structure is, uh, uh, remains intact. Um, the, the the fatty acid remains bound. Yeah? So what you see in a crystal structure uh, is not the really the position of the atoms. It's the other position of the atoms. And of, although uh, in the crystal actually stuff moves a lot less than in uh, free in, in, in uh, the water, uh, it still moves. Atoms don't stop uh, moving around. It's called temperature. Yeah? There's a te uh, somebody already said it's always warm at the view. Uh, temperature means that atoms are moving. If atoms are not moving, you are at zero Kelvin, and there's no temperature. So if there's a temperature, and usually when you find proteins, there is a temperature, uh, then then they're moving. Okay. Um, okay. So, so 
So when you think about a fold of protein, you shouldn't think about something like a brick or a wall or a house. Um, you should think of something that's more like this. It's always moving. Okay. Now, uh, we'll come back to this in the uh, crystal structure lecture as well, but just to show you that this, because the previous one was a simulation, uh, but just to highlight that you can actually uh, get also information on this dynamics from the crystal uh, structure data itself. It's called B factors. I saw that already mentioned them uh, yesterday, I think. Yeah. Although you, not, you didn't remember, yeah, you didn't mention it when I asked you about lecture. lecture. Um, and the B factors are sort of a well, technically they're sort of like a, uh, a, a parameter that describes the goodness of fit of the, uh, of the atom position to the experimental data. Uh, and a higher, uh, and higher B factor means a less good fit. But, uh, uh, and there's, there's different ways to interpret it, but uh, it's, it's linked to dynamics. So the parts of the protein that are more mobile, they'll, get, they'll, they'll be less easy to determine uh, the position of the, these atoms. Right? So uh, you'll find high B factors in the positions mm -hmm. that are much more mobile, in, in the, even in the crystal. And this is a comparison between uh, uh, the B factors in a crystal structure uh, in, from the PDB uh, and, uh, and the fluctuations in the simulation. And uh, I think the drawn line is the, uh, the simulation and the dotted line is the crystal structure. Uh, and so you can see that it does, it's not a perfect correspondence. But in most cases, the peaks are in the same positions. Right? So the, the parts that are <coughs> moving more in the simulation are also the parts that have a higher B factor in the crystal structure. How, how reliable is this? I mean, the crystal structure is, is already the result of an average, and then the, mo the model is also a result of just the model and not actual data. So is it like two unpredictable estimated things Good point. Uh, it's, it's for, unfortunately, it's not that bad, right? So the simulation models, uh, they're models, but they're they're and they're not reliable in all. Um, it depends what you're looking at, how reliable they are, right? So some some elements of the that some um, features of the protein that they simulate are better captured in the model than others, um, and and likewise for the crystal structure. But uh, um, so that's also why it's good to look for 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 the uh, you know, for word, uh, consistency between these things, right? And when when the model and the experimental data are consistent, then at least you have a little bit more uh, to go. With. Okay. Um, so where are we going? Yeah. So uh, so this is just dynamics, just fluctuations. Um, and there's also functional motions. Does anybody know, has, has, has some example of a uh, uh, functional motion of the protein? Maybe. Channels. Hmm? Channels. channels. Yeah. Yeah, well, there are different types of channels. Some are just like a channel, so they can go through. But you have channels that have different conformations, like an outward open and an inward open. Yeah, so they have to, to let the, the, it's more like a, a gate, if you, if you will. So to actually let the lig the ligand pass, they have to change conformation. Yeah. Exactly. So it's a close for a yeah. So sometimes you have a, a chemical reaction uh, that needs to happen in the absence of water, and 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 living systems are always full of water. So the the trick that nature evolved to to uh, to fix that is to have an active site that you can close. And, and enzymes literally work like that. <coughs> the ligand binds, the site closes, <coughs> chemistry goes on, it opens again, and the, the product uh, is released. Um, there's lots of different things. This is uh, an example of the uh, acetone receptor. Uh, it's a big dim. Um, let's see, maybe I can see No, the other way around. Oh, it's very dark here. Oh, is it better now than this thing? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's leave it like this. Um, yes. So the the uh, there's uh, it's uh, maybe it's, it's easy for me, for you to see, but the, the colors are not good for me. But I think it's pink here. There's a molecule bound. Uh, 
there's, a, there's also a molecule bound over there, which you can see is bigger. And you can see that the conformation of, of this helix, ma mainly, but there's lots of other small changes, uh, is different between these two uh, images. And it's actually the same molecule as the estrogen receptor in both cases. And in, on the left, there is uh, an activator uh, molecule bound, it's called uh, agonist or biochemist, um, which changes it to the active conformation. And if you bind another molecule there, it, it changes to an inactive conformation. Um, then this is when, uh, oh yeah, um, so this is this happens in one one spot. What you also have in some cases is, come on, you can do it. Yes, uh, is that uh, there's a little bit too much information on this slide, um, but you can actually have uh, a, 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 an enzyme which it has an active and an inactive uh, conformation. So then you have two binding sites: one where the ligand binds, and one where the activator molecule binds. And then it's called allosteric control, because then you change something in the binding of the ligand by binding another molecule at a different location of the drug. Um, if you want to know more about this, I think there's a whole chapter in Brandon and Tools about allosteric control. This is just to give you an example of that is, uh, that, is, um, uh, that this exists. OK. Um, um, this is brand new. Um, the other thing is that you might have already heard of uh, proteins having alternative uh, states, right? So instead of just the functional form, in this example is the prime protein, which in uh, in <coughs> sheep causes um, uh, scarring. Right? Yeah, right. Hmm? Yeah, and in cattle it causes uh, uh, mad cow disease, and in humans it causes uh, uh, poisonal charcoal. Yeah. Uh, homologous proteins um, and, and similar uh, phenotype or uh, 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 pathogenic uh, effect. Um, and it has, a, it has an active, uh, I, I, last time I looked this up, they didn't quite know yet what the normal function of this protein was. Like maybe by now they do. Uh, but it has an active, a normal native state, which is mainly alpha-helical, and it has a prionic state, which has beta structure. And what happens with this beta structure, you, oh, Sanna explain, well, how much did Sanna <coughs> explain about the structure of beta sheets yesterday? It stacks, right? The, the thing is, uh, it's a repetitive structure, <coughs> and you can keep on stacking it. It's like a zipper. Uh, so if you if you start with one protein and you, you take another one of them, you can stack one nice uh, right next to it. It's where this strand then stacks on to the other the, the opposite end of the, the previous molecule. So you get a structure that looks a little bit like this, and it's sort of like a polymer, uh, except the chemist would say that there's no covalent bond, so it's not a polymer. But it, it, it's it's something like that. Um, and uh, this is a different view of it. But on the background here, you see actually a microscope image of uh, the fibrils that form, like long stretches of sort of polymerized uh, prime protein uh, that accumulate in the in the tissue and uh, in the cells initially, but then in the tissue, uh, and destroy the function of the cells. And for even it's important for the tissue. So. This was quite new, I think, about 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago. Um, and by now, there's many, many examples of proteins that have uh, this, the, this so-called amyloid. So these are called amyloid fibrils. Uh, that, that actually, ha many proteins are actually now known to have an amyloid state, in addition to their native state, in which they function. Um, and in not, in all, not in all cases, but in many cases, uh, this amyloid state is associated with a disease. And it's often a, neuro, a neurological disease. Uh, I think there are some examples of non neurological disease. OK. So uh, this is also sort of dynamic, but it's a different, it's a dynamic at a different scale, right? Because we're, we're changing between two very different conformations of the protein. Um, but in a, in a lecture that's all about protein folding, well, this is misfolding, but misfolding is just a different type of folding. Okay, I don't feel comfortable here in the dark. Okay, 
So, um, so how do proteins fold? Any ideas? Actively? Sometimes. Is there something else in, uh, back there? Alice? Hydrophobic collapse. Okay. You read the chapter. Right? <laughs> um, yeah, so what you get, uh, so if you have a protein chain, and for simplicity I've drawn the hydrophobic residues as, as balls, so you know that there's hydrophobic, there's a, okay, let's do this uh, uh, properly. So uh, the backbone part of, of amino acids is always the same, right? Do you remember the four atoms that are in the backbone? I'm sure someone mentioned them yesterday. Very convenient to remember because that allows you to derive a lot of properties of proteins. So it starts with an N. That's why the protein chain starts with the N-terminal side. Then you get the C alpha, on which you have the side chain. And then you have, uh, sorry, then you have the, the, the second carbon, which is the carboxyl, which has an oxygen bound. And then you get the next residue, okay, another M, another C alpha, right? And if this is the uh, N terminus, then this one just has two hydrogens. This actually also has a hydrogen. Uh, this one has one hydrogen. And uh, but, uh, because we're lazy, and if you know your chemistry, there's no wiper here. Anybody see, see a wiper? Uh, and, and because if you know your chemistry, you can actually infer where the hydrogens are supposed to be. We actually never draw the hydrogens. So, that makes it a little bit less fun. So, okay. Um, so, this is always the backbone part. And, oh yes, the importantly, uh, these, these ones I sometimes draw because they're actually polar. But this part is polar, that part is polar, which means what? It's polar, it's not what? It's not hydrophobic, right? So this can this can interact with the water well. This part, the side chain, uh, there's there's a minuses that have a hydrophobic side chain, and there's some that have a hydrophilic side chain. Hydrophilic is then equivalent to polar. Yeah? Okay. Um, so some some side chains are hydrophobic and others are hydrophilic. And I've drawn the hydrophobic ones as balls here, so the, the intervening parts that are just the line uh, are the hydrophilic uh, amino acids. And then the protein will want to fold because of uh, the tendency of these hydrophobic uh, side chains to avoid contact with water. Yeah? So you get <coughs> most of the hydrophobics inside. And this is a two-dimensional image, right? So if there's water at the top, it doesn't work, but it's just, it's just a cartoon. It's not a real protein. Okay, if you actually uh, look at a real protein and you just visualize, uh, you can, in, a, in a viewer you can visualize all the hydrophobic residues, you'll see the majority are on the inside. But the outside still has hydrophobic residues. It's not that it's completely polar. It doesn't have to be. It just has to be uh, hydrophilic enough. Okay, so this is what drives protein for. Yes. Um, and the, the, the usual assumption is that this folded state is the native state, it's stable, and it's the functional state. Um, yay! Oh, sorry. Oh! Um, and you can actually unfold, but we'll get back to that in, in a minute. The other important thing to, to mention, and I'll, I'll, get, I'll, I'll get back to that uh, repeatedly in the next. 10 minutes or so, um, is that this is not a one-off event. It's not that uh, the ribosome spit out, spits out the protein chain, it folds, and then it's done. You remember my movie at the start, so proteins are dynamic, but this simulation was a very, very, very short time scale. It was about five nanoseconds. I don't know if you have any idea how short five nanoseconds is. It is about this short. It's the, the time that the light takes to get from the beamer to my hand. Yeah? That's 
a very short amount of time. Um, it's, it's, it's about this. Um, but the, so, um, what am I saying? Yes, so if you actually simulate longer, you'll actually start seeing bigger fluctuations, but bigger fluctuations involve much more of the protein moving together, so it has a lower probability of happening all at the same time. Um, and one of the biggest conformational changes that a protein can do, one of the biggest fluctuations, is completely unfolding. And proteins will actually do that all the time. But they also fall back. Right? So it's a dynamic equilibrium, and, and uh, it's like uh, two jumpers uh, <coughs> passing back uh, balls or chainsaws or whatever they, they, they want to impress their audience with. Um, um, and um, uh, but, but so at any point in time, each of the jugglers is holding one or two of these things. Probably not more because you have two hands. Um, but the, the, so the average amount of stuff they're holding is, is roughly uh, uh, stable, but they're holding different ones all at the same time. Okay. okay. So that's the dynamic equilibrium. Let's see. I want. Uh, oh. Um, so now, why do we know this? Why do we know that this happens? Proteins tend to aggregate. Oh, you mean that they denature? Oh, yeah, sorry, that's the next step. No, no. Uh, why do we know that this happens? <coughs> that they end up in the native state? Low energy? Yeah, but that's, low energy means it's, it's stable. So then I'm going to ask you, so how do we know that the, uh, that the, the lowest energy state exists? That's just rephrasing the question. Why do we know that this is a stable state which has a low uh, energy? It's in the state the most. They, the, this one there, where they in the most? Yeah, but how do we know it's there? Okay, you could do fluorescence experiments. It's, it, but think a little bit simpler. If this is the native state, what will the protein do in its native state? It has a biological function. It has a biological function. Mm -hmm. Yes? So it has to be in this state. That's true for most proteins, not all. Some proteins do not need a native state. Oh, that's a very weird way of saying it. it doesn't, they don't have a defined three-dimensional shape. And they're still functional. Right? That's maybe true for about one third of proteins. But that's for later. Uh, for now, uh, most proteins <coughs> that we're talking about today, they actually have this well defined three dimensional shape which allows them to function. And we can measure this function. It's maybe, uh, it's maybe an enzyme. So we, those are actually the, the first functional proteins that were studied were enzymes. Why? Because you can actually measure the chemical product that they, that they uh, produce. Yeah. So, um, and then. Uh, later, we were doing all sorts of uh, cool fluorescence experiments, and then you can also look at the uh, native states of proteins that do not produce a chemical that you can measure. Okay. So we know this happens. Then the next question is, how does this happen? That's the lecture of today, right? How does this happen? And the first step to that is to realize, um, well, I already told you why it happens. It's because... The, at least that's what I told you. It's because these hydrophobic side chains want, want to be uh, in the middle. But then, uh, why do we know it's just the protein doing this and there's no other stuff involved? That it's not, because somebody said, uh, I think it was you, said they, there's some activity, you know, there's an active thing that, that actually folds the protein. So there's a lot of active folding in cells. Yes, that's true. But. Uh, <laughs> Ah, the timing could have been so nice. <laughs> I'm sorry? But that's not what your story is about. No. <laughs> ah, oh, right. Ah, there's, there's something else first. Sorry. Sorry. Um, 
the important, so, so the one thing to hammer this in is, uh, so why do these hydrophobic residues, why do you get this hydrophobic collapse? collapse? I already mentioned it, it's because of the water, right? So if you don't consider the water, how that works, right? Uh, it's essential. Yeah? So if you're only looking at the interactions within the protein, it doesn't make sense, because there's lots of interactions that you could make that could be much more favorable. But you have to balance them with the interactions. Right? Why couldn't you put all the hydrophilic residues inside? They're polar. They'll make hydrogen bonds. They're super stable. Yeah? It's because energetically it doesn't matter whether you make a hydrogen bond internally or with the water. Same hydrogen bond, same energy. Yeah? Okay. So you have to put the water. Now the other thing is, why do proteins why do we know that proteins fall this way? And uh, nah. so annoying. Uh, this goes, goes back uh, uh, more than half a century to uh, Anfinson, uh, Cyrus. Uh, you know, correctly, Cyrus Anfinson. I think there's a. Uh, he got the Nobel Prize for this about uh, 20 years later. Um, and uh, he was studying the relationship between structure and function in enzymes. Um, and why enzymes? As I already told you, because you can measure the, the activity by looking at the chemicals they produce. And the assumption is if they're active, they must be full. Yeah? Um, and uh, he said his idea was that the information determining the tertiary structure, sort of fold, the fold the shape of the protein, is the chemistry of its amino, amino acid sequence. Yeah? Now we know all about sequences, you just had a whole course of that uh, by yeah, right? um, and, and I think we mentioned something about sequences in fundamentals as well. So we know something about these sequences. And what he did was a very clever, clever uh, um, <coughs> uh, trick. The, he, he had some tricks to disrupt the three-dimensional structure of the protein, show that it was no longer chemically active, then, uh, uh, th and then show that you could actually refold the protein. Right? So you make, you make a solution of the pure protein, nothing else in the solution. You denature it, it it's no, no longer active. You renature it, and it's active again. So that shows that it's only the protein molecule itself that does this for you. Yeah? So now, there's also examples, or there's also exceptions to this. Uh, there's only, I always say there's only one rule in biology that has no exceptions, is that all rules in biology have exceptions. Yeah? It's biology. It, it, it was never designed. It's, it's just a messy, evolved stuff. Uh, most proteins can spontaneously fall to their native, native form. And certainly in experimental conditions, if you get the conditions right, they will reform. In the cell, it's more difficult because it's messy. There's lots of proteins all jumbled together. If you don't fold fast enough, you'll start aggregating, uh, just bumping together. Because if you just want to bury your hydrophobics, you don't have to do it yourself. You can do it with your neighbors. That's much easier. So then you start aggregating. Uh, so in, 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 in the cell, there's, there's chaperones and all sorts of other mechanisms to either avoid or repair this kind of misfold. But Proteins by themselves, most of them they can spontaneously. Yeah. Do not the denatured proteins function? Uh, well, that's what I mentioned before. So there are there is a class of proteins which are called um, oh different lecture. It's a different different vocabulary. Um, um, not unstructured. Take uh, what's the name? In no. Disordered. Disordered, yes, thank you. Disordered proteins, yes. <laughs> and um, and I'm, I'm, I'm still sure that, that different people mean slightly different things with that. One way to be disordered is to have a, a three-dimensional shape that isn't like normal globular proteins. So it has a, uh, one, the other way to be disordered is to actually not have a defined three-dimensional shape that would be really floppy. I think most, in most cases it's really floppy, but I, I, there's also some cases where a protein actually does have a structure, but it doesn't look nice. Yeah, so, so, okay. um, so now, this is, uh, this is actually called now the thermodynamic hypothesis. It, most people say Anthonson's uh, theorem, uh, which just says it's just the thermodynamics, it's, it's the physics of the molecule, the protein molecule itself <coughs> that drives the force. <coughs> Fitting. So, and it's nice because we already have. Uh, mm -hmm. 
battery dying? Is the battery dying? Why is the laser still? Um, okay. So, we, you know the central dogma of uh, molecular biology, right? DNA make. Oh, God, what a mess. DNA makes RNA makes protein, right? That's molecular biology. Now, what we're actually interested in, and, th and this is sequence, right? This is sequence. What we're actually interested in is not the folded protein. We're actually, in the end, we're interested in the function. Right? So what Antonsen's theorem actually says is is, uh, is that you can do this. So you can go from sequence to structure and uh, without any interference. Right? So the sequence that you have in the DNA actually determines what you have in the structure. Which is nice because that's uh, what a lot of bioinformatics is about and certainly if you're talking about structural bioinformatics. Uh, it's very nice that you can, can do it this way. And then from structure to function is still more trivial, but at least uh, we're, we're, we're half off. Uh, right, okay, so he tells us what the proteins do, right? But he still doesn't tell us how they do it. Yeah. Uh, so they form a structure based on the sequence, so the rest of the lecture is about half. Um, and the first thing that we have to realize is that we run into the next problem. Uh, so proteins fold quite fast, uh, about from, let's say, uh, around milliseconds to seconds. Oh, sorry. Uh, a fraction of a second to about an hour. A thousand seconds is, uh, is about 20 minutes. In fact, this is slow, right? but it's still quite fast. And uh, certainly if you realize that if you, um, that the, how complex a protein molecule actually is. So let's say we have uh, 100 amino acids, and you know the backbone angles, phi and psi, the angles that, that you have with the flexibility in the, in the backbone, right? This one is not so interesting, this is the terminus. Uh, but each of them, each residue has two of these torsion angles. Right? So now suppose, that there's sort of three torsion angles that you can choose for each of them. That means you have uh, three options for about 200 different angles to choose from. How many different conformations can you make with such a flexible snake? Hmm? Three to the 99, as I hear it here from. Anything else? Three to the power two hundred, right? Uh, order of magnitude. Yeah. Uh, which is about ten to the ninety-five. That's a big number. Yeah. There's a different way to look at this. You, someone also did. Someone also introduced the Ramachandran plot. Yes. So if you make a plot of phi against psi, you see these these three areas. It looks a little bit like this. Uh, and never go know where phi and psi goes. Uh, and you have, you have a better sheet over here, and a little bit over, over here. Then you have the helix here, and then you have the left handed helix over there. So if you say, okay, well, per amino acid, I have three possible states. It could be helix, trend, uh, sorry, strand, helix, or left handed helix. Very rough approximation. Yeah, you get a slightly smaller number, uh, but it's still a big number. Just to give you an idea of how big this is, and this is actually the source of Levinpool's paradox. It's really just dead. Um, let's say uh, a protein needs about a picosecond to uh, find a new conformation. So it's in a particular conformation. Uh, and then it needs a quick second to move <coughs> to the next one. This is a fairly short amount of time. This is a nanosecond in light speed. So uh, this is a meter, and a picosecond is a millimeter. Yeah. Um, that means that if you would need to go through all these 10 to the 47, I've taken, I'm taking a smaller number here, yeah, just to be on 10 to the 47 times 10 to the minus 12 seconds. That means you need about 10 to the 35 seconds which is about 10 to the 28 years. 
um, the universe started 10 to the, about 10 to the 10 years ago. So there's no way that proteins can fall within the lifetime of the universe. What's the, what's the problem with this paradox? Because we know proteins fall. Where does this assumption, where, where, there must be an assumption here that, that makes this go wrong. Tries every confirmation. I'm sorry? It tries every, every single one. Yes, yes, the assumption here is, is here, right? If you assume an exhaustive search, meaning you have to go through each and every one of these, or maybe not through all, but a large fraction of them, let's say 1%. Yeah, even 1% of 10 to the 28 is still a large number of years. You can't do it. You can't search any sizable fraction of this number of confirmations. Yeah, so there must be a path to follow for the protein to get from a random state, an unfolded state, to the forward state. Yeah? It must be a lot simpler. So this is what physicists and biophysicists and lots of other people have been working on since well before 1968. Yeah. Um, we're, we're getting there, oh, slowly, we're not there yet. I'll show you some of the steps along the way. Yeah. So to put this in a different uh, perspective, uh, it's fully extended to fully folded in a fraction of a second. Uh, I don't know how he does it, Levendorf says. Yeah. Spectacular, the Guardian. From fully extended to twice nightly, yeah, because it's a dynamic equilibrium. It's just not just one though. It just goes. That's the other thing, right? It just doesn't doesn't just fall. It unfolds and refolds. Right? It does this continuously. Okay. So um, so this is called the protein folding problem. And in bioinformatics, we, we it's just the end goal that we're interested in. What's the structure? Just then we can do other calculations. If you're a biophysicist, <coughs> and I, I grew up being a biophysicist. And you never really get away from that. Uh, they really want to actually understand not just what a, what's the end state, but also how does the, how does he do it? How does he do it? Right? Okay. Now, um, experiments don't tell us because we can't really uh, go into the molecule and measure everything that happens at these short timescales and at all the detail that we would like. So what we can do is. I already showed you in the beginning, simulations. And uh, about 15 years ago, uh, one year after I finished my PhD, there was this very nice paper where they uh, looked at uh, protein folding simulations in the sub millisecond time scale. Uh, this was um, the, the simulation I showed you of a protein before, it was a nanosecond. That's already quite a lot of CPU time. Computers get faster, but in 2003, this was still quite extensive uh, bit of simulation. And they looked at three different, uh, no, this is not three, this is five. Five different examples of very fast folding proteins. Uh, if you ask a biologist, this is not a protein, this is a peptide. It's even not a very big peptide. But anyway, for a biophysicist, this is a small protein. Um, so this is a very small protein, this is just a beta hairpin. Uh, and, and some Peter happens are actually uh, stable. Um, this is the smallest <coughs> bit of protein sequence that actually forms an internal hydrophobic contact. Sort of just one, it's a couple of atoms. Um, it's not a protein, but it's it's smallest hydrophobic. It's not even a hydrophobic core, but it's something hydrophobic on the inside. Yeah. Um, and, but it falls very, very, very fast. I mean, we know that because we can do the spectroscopy experiments at a femtosecond time scale, so we can actually see how fast it falls. This is just a single helix. Uh, helices by themselves are typically uh, relatively stable. They can be stable, at least depends on the sequence, obviously. And this is the simplest helix that you can make that's also stable, it's a polyalanine. Yeah, it's just as the one, so an alanine only has one, uh, one uh, methyl group here, carbon with three. Uh, 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 hydrogens, so it's actually hydrophobic, but it's still stable uh, in uh, in water. Uh, we'll, let's not go into why. Okay, <coughs> so this is half of the story because this is um, so this is the amount of simulation time they needed to fold these proteins, so they could actually show that they fold in the simulation, which is nice by itself because that's a very nice foundation of your model. 
because if, if it doesn't fall, then there's something wrong with your model. Um, and it says nanoseconds and CPU days. But this is now different because this is 2003 CPUs, but it took about a day to simulate one nanosecond of uh, time for the drug. Yeah? Um, and just to point it out, a hundred, uh, well, the, the, the largest one is not quite 100,000, but it's like 30,000 or so uh, CPU days. And of course, you don't do this serial, you do this parallel with many CPUs same time, but it's still about half a year of CPU time on a, back, on a big supercomputer in, in 2003. So you need, you need a, a big, well-funded research group to be able to do that. Um, the next thing they did was, uh, was even cooler. So now you remember the, the height of the bars in the previous plot. Uh, now that's the predicted folding time in nanoseconds from the simulation. Um, and a lot of other people actually, if you think these simulations are expensive, the experimental work is also expensive to do because uh, it's really tricky. So they had three different groups do, or I don't know if they, I don't remember if they did it together or if this was done, if they extracted this information from literature. But at least three different groups actually looked at these uh, proteins from an experimental point of view and also determined. The, the speed at which they fall in the experiment. And uh, as you can see, that this very, very nicely correlates. Yeah, so the, the polyalanine uh, falls in about so 10 nanoseconds, the alphelix in about 100, the beta hairpin in about 1,000, and then the, the small proteins in somewhere around 10,000 nanoseconds. 10,000 nanoseconds, it's uh, 10 microseconds. So that's still quite short. A microsecond is one thousandth of a millisecond. Right? Uh, so that's why they started with these things because they fall so fast. You can still track them. Uh, you, can, you can still measure that experimentally, but you can also simulate them because they're so fast. But you also see that these are exponential uh, scales, and this polyalanine is about eight or ten residues long. This is 20 residues. So this is a fact. This is not even a factor of three difference, and this is not even a real protein. This is a big peptide. Uh, this is already 10 microseconds, and it, co it continues going exponentially. So if you go from 20 to 30, then you go from uh, from microseconds to milliseconds for time. Right. So this this really explodes. So that's just one of the reasons why we haven't solved the problem. It's just because it becomes so complicated to calculate uh, as your molecule becomes bigger. And, and, uh, really, and the average protein is about, it depends where you look, but let's say about 300 uh, amino acids long, if you look at a single domain. Um, so that, that's really still an issue. Okay. It's time for a break, doesn't it? Okay. Um, so actually, what what uh, and why does it? One of the reasons that uh, sort of one of the highlights of what what then happens if you're falling a bigger protein is that uh, not everything can fall at the same time. So what first happens, and this is this is the first step that is called the hydrophobic collapse. So you, there's two things happening. All hydrophobic side chains want to, want to try and get into the middle of the protein all at the same time. And at the, at, the, at the same time, you get the first <coughs> local secondary structures formed. This is called the hydrophobic group. So you get this first bit of helix, and you get a blob of hydrophobic stuff on the inside. And this is relatively fast. Fast. Yes. Fast. Um, <laughs> relatively fast. Um, what then has to happen is that all the other stuff has to rearrange. Right? And then you, you finally get your beta sheets uh, formed. And that then relatively so. So this first step uh, happens on, on the microsecond time scale. This is milliseconds to seconds to sometimes hours for bigger proteins. So this has, so have we now solved Leventhal's paradox? Mm, or sort of one step in the, in the way, right? So let's, let's leave, so what would be, the next step to solve Lambdos. 
paradox. I'll leave that for you to think over. Okay.